and all, I'm just here interviewing Big Ben for uh, president of the SU. Hello. Hello, Ben. <laughs> so, um, we'll go straight into it. What experience do you have that makes you qualified to be the president of the SU? Sure, so for the past six months, I have been the Democracy and Development Officer at the Students' Union. In that time, I've got the University to Harvard, how much they fine you if you lose your University ID card. I've got more microwaves coming in Term 3. I've launched three new nights at the SU, Reflect a Cocktail and Glow. I've got free boiling water in the library, loads more. So I've already been a SAB and done loads of stuff. Before that, I was President of the Politics Society, so I know how to lead a team. Okay, so if kind of, you have a big team underneath you, how would you kind of go about motivating them and kind of making sure that everything around campus is... Of going as you hope it to be going? Sure, so in terms of the team leadership stuff, um, there are seven SABs, you lead that team, and you also lead the much larger student officer team, and, and then of course the entire union as well. And it's a lot to juggle, but from my time in the politics society where we had an exec of I think it was 12 or 13 people, I know you need to balance between different people, you need to make sure you're treating everyone fairly and equally, everyone feels respected, everyone feels they know what they're doing in their roles. Um, it's about making sure everyone feels valued on the team. Okay, and um, what kind of what do you think is the biggest issue that faces the students at the moment that you'd like to tackle with that team? Sure. So no surprise, I'm going to say the university's disciplinary processes. So that is in the wake of the group chat scandal. Um, the university council, of which I'm a full member at the moment, has launched an independent review of the processes, and I've got three things that I want to make sure happen in that review. First off, I want proper student representation at every level and at every stage of the review so that we are there representing student voices and the university isn't assuming what systems we need to keep us safe. Second, I want to um, have clear timelines from the university, clear timelines and stages on when they're going to finish that review, when its recommendations are going to be implemented. And finally, I want to... Um, like my third, that's it. a clear statement of values. Sorry about that. A clear statement of values are from the university on what is and is not acceptable on our campus. So a clear line that we need to face the fact that something like the group chat will happen again. It's an inevitability, and the thing we can change is how the systems respond to it to keep us safe. And we need those systems to be ready for that and fit for purpose. Okay, so you mentioned kind of your stance about that, but um, with the group chat, one of the biggest thing was the fact that they were allowed to review the process, and that was then going to a different board. Would you think that? A review is something that should still be kind of in the process, or do you think that it, once your kind of your stance is there, you've gone through the process, so that's it, kind of that should that's it, like the students would have another chance to kind of review it. It's a fair point. I think I don't want to get super into the specifics of how I think the new system would work because the university is doing a review with a lawyer and everything. That's not my place. I'm there to give a view, but not to say it out. But on that, I think right of appeal is very important for the accused. Because this isn't, this isn't just for cases like the group chat, this is cases like drugs cases or people who have supposedly cheated in exams, anything like that. Uh, I think there should be some element where if you feel you've been done wrongly by the system, if there is some reason why the original panel ruled incorrectly, you have a chance to set out that case. And the appeals panel doesn't have to agree with you. And maybe there should be a further uh, review of that appeal where it can be vetoed by perhaps an independent body if necessary. Something like that I wouldn't be against. But I think fundamentally right of appeal is important, but as long as it is being balanced. And I think even if there is a right of appeal, if, like I say, there's a value statement from the university clearly setting out what we believe in as a community, there's no risk of something like this happening again because they've broken the rules. You can't appeal the fact that you have broken the rules if you, they found the evidence of it. Okay, yeah. Um, and also, kind of one of the big things that the group chat affected and kind of a lot of things that's been talked about recently is mental health and how kind of like it's, it's a big topic throughout the elections as well kind of what is your stance on mental health and what would you do to kind of help the provisions that are in place to help people that are struggling with their mental health? Absolutely so again mental health is one of my top priorities right at the top of my manifesto. Um, the first thing I want to do quite a straightforward one is bring counselling from Westwood to Senate House. So the university has currently consolidated all of their wellbeing services into Senate House except for counselling. I want to bring counselling over so we can have in Senate House, right at the heart of campus, a big centre for wellbeing, mental health, to show we're taking it seriously. You know, we put it at the heart of our campus. That is how important this mental health crisis solving it is to the university. So all in Senate House. And second, I want to... Uh, so in 2015, there was a Freedom of Information request to the university about how much they spend per student on mental health funding. And we are very far down the table in terms of the universities. I want to see the university committing to at least doubling that to bring it up to at least the Russell Group average. And it kind of, what would you do to help encourage students, per se, if they are struggling with their mental health, to kind of go to those services? Because obviously you can have them in place, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that students are going to go and take advantage of that. What would, what would you say to those sort of students? Absolutely. Um, I'd say it's important to reach out if you need help, but also to remember the university isn't the only option. So we need to make sure that people are getting the information about what's out there. But also it's important to remember that many people are probably uncomfortable going to the university, especially after the group chat. 
I don't think it's right to throw all university services in together and say you can't trust the university. I think the mental health team are amazing. But it's very easy for people to feel that way and that's a completely legitimate way to feel. And for cases like that, we have the advice centre here at the SU. We're completely independent. And I think we have a job to do in advertising that fact that we're independent. We're separate to the university. No matter what you tell us, we're not telling the university. Okay, that's interesting. And kind of talking about spaces, while we're talking about spaces, there's a big thing about study space crisis at the moment. Kind of what would you do to tackle that? And is it, is it a big thing on your agenda? Absolutely. Again, another one of my top ones. Um, so in the past six months as DDO, I've sat on a uh, few committees that deal with buildings on campus, so University Estates Committee, Finance Committee and University Council. And on all those committees I've sort of followed the policy of if the university proposes a new building or an extension to an existing building and it doesn't include additional study space open to all students, I will oppose it and I will say where are the additional study spaces. I want to carry that on as president. Also, I've got a raft of stuff on this, so first off I think it's more important to get more off-campus study space. So we have a learning grid in the Leamington Town Hall, which is always overbooked. I want to explore options for a learning grid in South Leamington and one in Earlsdon. Uh, I want the old sports centre to have some study spaces put into it. The university's considering it, but they've not made their final decision yet. I want to push them that we get study spaces in the old sports centre when sports moves to the sports hub. And I want a firm commitment to a second library from the university. Because for the past three or four years, they've talked about it and they've never really come down on whether it's happening or not. I want a firm commitment, we need a second library and we need lots of study space in it. Okay, and kind of once you've got those spaces in place and kind of you've got everything that you want, is there anything kind of on your agenda to try and improve like booking process? Like you say, it's kind of often they're fully booked. Is there anything that you do to kind of try and improve the process to make sure that they're not fully booked or if they are fully booked, it's easier for people to kind of realise and they can go to different spaces as such? Sure, so the library has just launched the Book a Desk system. Uh, which they're piloting and I'm really interested to see the feedback from that because if it I've heard a lot of mixed reviews some people really like the idea of it of knowing if you come to campus as a fixed place you have others get annoyed because if people book desks and then don't actually come and take them so I, I would wait to see the feedback from that pilot review because I'm, I'm hesitant to set all study space aside for book a desk or something like that just because I as a student really enjoyed the freedom of knowing I could come onto campus when I wanted and find a study space because my department Pace has a common room and there was generally spaces in it um, but if you don't have that freedom to know that there will be spaces in your common room, you, you need something like Book of Death perhaps. So I'm really looking forward to the feedback from that pilot. Yeah, and um, again, kind of with the spaces in Leamington and stuff like that, kind of how would you go about kind of lobbying for that? Because obviously it's off campus, it's going to be a lot more kind of issues there that the university would have to deal with. Kind of what, would, what would your main process be for that? Sure, so as I mentioned they have one in Leamington already so I think it's not unprecedented, they're interested in it um, and I think if we convinced them that off-campus learning spaces are something that students are interested in they'd be very interested. Uh, but this feeds into some other conversations I've had this year in those committees I mentioned earlier about the university master plan. This is their big plan for campus and what it's going to look like up to 2030 and beyond and we've had conversations about how the university needs to stop thinking as, of Warwick University as the, I think it's 720 hectares or whatever this campus occupies it's it, when students go out into the community they're learning and doing things related to the university in their homes in Leamington, in Coventry, in Kenilworth um, and that in a way is part of the university estate as well and need to start thinking of it in a holistic way so that's not just transport, that's study space, that's everything else, it's the entire local community as well. And can you, Lisa, you mentioned there about often things being looked at in the future with the university and that kind of leads to a lot of students maybe feeling disenfranchised and kind of not necessarily getting involved with so much SU stuff. How would you go about kind of increasing the kind of participation and getting people more involved with the SU as a whole? Sure, so that's a big part of my current job as DDO. Um, in autumn, I cut a lot of the red tape and a lot of the bureaucracy involved in getting involved in SU elections. So I removed the fee, the uh, deposit you have to pay to be a candidate in the elections. And I also got rid of all the paper physical forms you had to bring in, so you could do it all online. And that saw us reach record-breaking number of people running and record-breaking number of people voting in the autumn elections. Uh, we've seen similar stuff now in spring, so I haven't been as involved in these elections because I'm a candidate, they wouldn't let me. But I think some of that is the legacy of removing those hurdles, as we are now seeing massive increases in participation across the board. I really want to carry that on, especially with communities around campus we don't engage well with. Um, so, for example, the business school and the medical school never really turn out. We don't really talk to them, they don't really talk to us. We need to be out there making the case for the issue and asking them what they want us to do rather than just assuming what they want and giving it to them. We need to talk to them and start that dialogue. And finally, what's your biggest achievement, would you say, kind of at work? My biggest achievement? Ooh, as a student or as a SAB? Or can I choose? However you want to take it. Sure. Uh, so, mm, as a SAB, I'm going to say, just because 
it became such a pet project of mine, it's the university ID card charge. So at the start of term two, they brought in a £10 fine for when you lost your ID card. Previously it was completely free, you just got a new one. And I, they hadn't consulted us, it just came out of the blue. I was really upset by it, so I immediately I got my emails, I was sending emails to everyone in the university I could think of, I was bringing it up in committees it wasn't even relevant in, um, and I stuck at it. And after only just two or three weeks, I got them to say, okay, we messed up, we shouldn't have done this, we'll bring it down to £5, we'll consider taking it down further, they're looking into the option of replacing it for free the first time you lose it, and they've said, and next time they think about changing that charge, they're going to get students and the student union involved. So that was sort of my pet project that just cropped up, wasn't in my manifesto, just something I dealt with on the fly, but I was really proud of that because I think it makes a real difference to a lot of people. All right, well, thank you for talking to us today. It's been nice to interview you. Thank you very much for having me.